or uh, just for a typical static page that you might be setting up. So I will go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, here is a test page that I'm setting up or that I have already set up for us to use. Um, I also wanted to mention that this meeting is being recorded. So uh, if anybody would like us to send them the link to it afterwards, just contact your project manager and we'll be able to do that for you. So uh, here is your typical static page. Um, I set up the static page by starting here in your sitemap that you would see on your website. You would add a new page here in the top right corner. You would name the page in the type. You would select static page to set up a static page, or you'd set up a dynamic module page if you wanted module information to pull into this page. But in this case, we'll just be doing a static page. So once you click that, then you can go ahead and start with your content on this page. Since I already set one up and I have a few examples in there, then I will just open this here. Okay, so for this page, I uh, put in a bunch of kind of dummy content to just display uh, some of the different functionalities that we have on here. So I'll just start at the front here. Um, so this first this first field here is for your heading type or what type of text that you want to use. So to add uh, an H1, let's say, you would highlight any content that you want to be that. You select, and then now this is an H1 header. Um, this is the biggest that it can get. Um, and to screen readers and to Google, this is the most important information on this page. So they'll look at that first before they look at anything else. Um, if we go down, I'll preview this page so we can just see it. So in all of your pages on your website, the title of your page, so whatever you put up here, is going to automatically appear here. Now, when it pulls in automatically, it automatically makes it into an H1 or a header one. Um, the way that Google and websites work is they will start at the page, they'll find an H1, and then it'll work down the hierarchy to determine the importance of things. So it's never, uh, in within your content, you will never want to have an H1 because there's already an H1 right here. This should be the most important information on the page since it is uh, basically describing what the page is. So if we go back in here, we wouldn't want it to be an H1, but in this case, we'll do an H2. And then it's a little bit smaller. These are all preset for your website, so they should all be set up for you automatically. And then you can continue down the line and see the rest of the heading sizes. All the way to six. Now you see that this has a little scroll bar here. You'll see, you might see a formatted address, normal div formatted. This is going to be the format that automatically gets enabled if you cut and paste uh, some text from another website that uses different styling from this one, then this is just how it can read the basically read the text that you're putting onto there and then convert it into code for websites and Google to read. Uh, address, this indicates that it's an address that you're putting down. Uh, the screen reader will know that and it'll read it off like an address opposed to just reading straight through a line of text. And normal div, this isn't something that you would worry about. Uh, this is automatically done by your WYSIWYG whenever there's div elements. It's basically just separating uh, one chunk of text from another. Uh, but you don't have to worry about that one. It's done automatically. So if we want to move on, we see there's styles here. Uh, there's a drop down and any styles that you set up can end up there. 
So I did this here. I just put or typed in test styling. I'll do it again down here. You would just highlight it just like we did with the headers, styles, and then it looks like that. So these are not automatically preset. There might not be anything in this dropdown. So I can show you how to set that up. So if we go back and we're starting here looking at our homepage or our sitemap, we can see on the left here in this little websites box, there's a website styles. So if I click that, then we see the one style that we currently have set up on the website. So if you, you can add a new style and then you'll see all of these fields here, since I already have one set up, then I'll just edit this one. You'll see the same exact fields. You'll name it. This name won't, it, it won't show anything on the front end. Um, it's just what shows up here. So that's your title, CSS class. CSS is basically a fancy word or a coding word for styling. This is also internal. It really doesn't matter what it is. Uh, you can auto suggest and then it'll just give you what the name is in a computer readable uh, text. So then you can go down and for your style type, you can either have container, image, normal, ordered list, paragraph, table, unordered list. Uh, these can be used in any way that you would like. Uh, containers are going to be um, basically what it's describing, a container. Uh, you can add, if let's say you made this a container style type and you made the border width 20 and the border color blue, then you could apply this style to whatever text that is, and then it'll give a container around it with uh, all of the specifications that you made. Um, you can play around with these and uh, try things out and uh, you know try to make your own styles. In this example, since we'll just keep it simple, um, we'll just do normal. So this is just for normal text, just like we did before. Once you select your type, then you can go into your font family and we have all of these fonts preloaded. Uh, you can switch it up to whatever you like and you see in the preview that the style or that the font changes. We'll leave that on impact for now. Font size, how big do you want it to be? You can make it bigger, uh, make it smaller, whichever you would like. Whoops, I hit enter by accident. Um, and then down here you have your color picker where you can choose the color of your text. It's important when you're choosing colors that you test it and look at it on the front end to make sure that no color contrast issues are going to arise that can uh, cause compatibility problems, accessibility problems, and so on. Font style, you can make it italic or bold. Line height, what this is, is if you are let's say for example here line height is if let's say this was your entire text that you're uh, typing out line height is going to be the space in between these two lines here then you have background color if you wanted to add a background color then you can add one here you would select drag here click that button and then it would give you a background here. This is a bad example of two colors, or it could be a good example of what not to do. So um, I wouldn't want to do this. Blue and red isn't really easy on the eyes. Uh, I have never used a background color before for text. Uh, we have a highlighting feature, which I'll show you within the WYSIWYG, so this isn't exactly necessary. So we'll just bring that back to white. Okay. Padding. Uh, padding, this is basically a percentage of, that goes right around your text that is going to pad anything else that's around it. So any surrounding text around this text would have a padding of X amount of pixels. Margin is similar to padding, but margin will come after the padding. Um, it, it's basically just two layers of styling that you have 
uh, and you can adjust those and find whichever padding margin that you'd like or fits your needs best. Border width, this is just the, the width of the border. If you want to have a border around your text, uh, so that's 20 pixels right there. It's going to go directly and pick up the color that you used for your font color, and then it's going to make a border for you. Border color, if you want to change it from the font color, then you can do that here. Enabled, yes or no. If it's not enabled, then it won't show up in that WYSIWYG dropdown. And then once you're all done, you hit save. Now, in my experience, I've used website styles mainly for just making, uh, making different heights or sizes of text. A common mistake that people will make is if they want text to be really big, then they'll just make it an H1. When that's not really what you're supposed to do, since your H1 is already in the title, it's supposed to be the most important thing on that website page in the eyes of Google. So if you wanted to just have a style for bigger text, if you don't like the styling or the size of your current text, you can go in and make a style for, we can make this 100 if you wanted, and it could be gigantic. And this would just be a normal style. So the computer wouldn't think that this is a heading of any sort. Okay. So that is your styles. Now, in this section here, these are pretty much all, all except for one. They're just tools that um, you would see in a common Word document or something like that. So with any text, just like we had before, you can highlight it, you can make it bold, italicize it, underline. And then here, if you don't want any of that, then you can just remove formatting there. On Word, that's like the format eraser. It's the same exact functionality. You can change alignment here. Move it wherever you'd like in regards to left, center, or right. You can make a numbered list. You can make a bulleted list or an unnumbered list. Or if you don't want to do that, then you can just select it again, and then it'll put it back to normal. Now, here is block quote. I did a little test earlier and this is our sandbox so it's not always updated with the latest styling that we have but on i will pull up an example of one of our websites that use so here's custom made boxes they have a really nice site here showing uh, all of their products and right here would be what uh, quote text would be so if you wanted to add something as a quote you could say quote text and then just like we've been doing before you highlight it click this and it won't show up on here and it won't show up on uh, most other WYSIWYGs either or content editors either once you save and view it, then the styling will show. So this editor right here won't always show the, the quote text style, but it, if it indents, then you know that it, uh, it did work and it will appear as a quote text on the front end. So here we have our indentations. If I wanted to just, if I didn't quite want to move this to the middle, then I could just use this indent button and indent it over a few. So now it's just slightly over than what it was. And you can put it back. Here is going to be your text color. You can change the color of your text. We'll make it blue. That would be a bad example of, or a good example of what not to do. The, the light blue on white is not good. Whenever you're changing text color, you always want to make sure that it's easy on the eyes to make sure that it's accessible to uh, anybody who might be viewing that page. Same thing with highlighting. You would just highlight your text, choose your highlight color, and then it's highlighted for you. Remove those. So now we can move on to this section of the WYSIWYG. Uh, here are where you can add symbols. You can add a symbol like this. And then your symbol just appears there. We have all sorts of different sections, um, lots of different units. Um, you can choose and use those as needed. Now here's an image. 
these images come from your website files. So within your website files, which live here on your site, I'll just go over here to show you. So we, you have your folders here, you can click into folders, and then here's all of your images. If we go back to that page, and we want to insert an image we would just click that button and then browse server now you can go in here and this is exactly what we just saw earlier within the website files uh, you see your test folder um, we'll just choose this one as an example so here it'll give you a preview of what it could look like on your site so here, this is just the URL. This will automatically populate once you choose one from browse server. Alternative text, this is important for accessibility. What alternative text does is it tells the screen reader that, uh, or what the image is if the person using the website, uh, let's say is blind. Then the computer would be able to tell, this is the global reach logo. And then it would read it to the person and then they would know what the image is. If it's not, if there's nothing here in the alternative text, then uh, it will bring up accessibility issues. Now, if the image is, let's say of just a generic flower, then you don't need alternative text because the image doesn't really provide any substance to the content on that page. Uh, but Regardless, I always put in alternative text just to make sure that there's going to be no compliance issues and your site is going to be accessible to everybody. So we'll just leave this. That you can adjust your width and height. Uh, this image just happens to be a perfect square. So whatever I change this to, the height will adjust so it stays proportional. Um, if you don't want that and you want to stretch it out, you can click this lock ratio button to unlock it. And now you can change this to whatever. So now it's going to be a thousand or a hundred pixels tall, but 500 pixels wide. Uh, most of the time you're going to want to keep it locked. So the picture doesn't look distorted at all. But if you do have a need for that, then you can do that. If let's say you want to get it back to what it originally was, you can just click this reset size button and then it'll bring it back to the original dimensions that it was. Border, you just type a number here, you can do 15 and then it will put a black border around the image that you're using. If you don't want one, then you just leave that blank and then there won't be a border around the image. H space and V space, H stands for horizontal space and V is for vertical space. Uh, this is basically just adding a margin around, uh, around your image. So if you see here, this has uh, a little preview of what it could look like. And you can see that the text is pretty close to the image. It's snug right up against it. So if I put 10 here, then that will add 10 pixels of margin or space in between anything on the left and right side of the image. If I want to add some vertical space, then that will add some space here. Um, this is just a preview, but it, on the front end, this would not be so close and it would be down here. Um, but once you save and preview or save and publish, then you'll be able to see that the spacing works out. Alignment here, you can go left or right. Oops, I'll just do left for example. And then we look up here and we see that we have a couple more tabs. You can link your image. So if you want to link this somewhere within your website files or to a website page, then you can browse server and then you can either pick from a page up here or you can pick from one of your website files in here. If you want to link to an external site or uh, somewhere else that's not within your admin, then you can just paste the URL right there. And then whenever somebody clicks on the image, it'll take them right to that URL. Down here, we have target. There's new window, topmost, same, and parent. The only ones that you really need to use is same window or new window. 
New window I recommend for external links when uh, users are clicking and the link is taking them away from your site. It'll open up a new tab so then your site isn't lost. Um, so then they can easily get back to it. They don't have to just click the back button to try to get back to what they were looking at before. Same window, if you're going somewhere internal on your site, let's say this link was taking you to another page on your site, I would leave this as same window because it's still on your site and they can't get lost if it's your own site. Then advanced, I don't do anything in here um, for images at least. Uh, there's nothing really to offer if you're really into HTML and CSS editing then uh, you can contact your project manager and we can give you more information about this. So if I click OK here, now we'll see that the image appeared here, but all of this text appeared right next to it. That's because we aligned it to the left. You can just keep hitting enter until it gets down there and it will be away from the image can redo the alignment. Let's say I want to align this image in the center. We'll go in here. We'll set this to not set. And then now you can click just to the end of the image and then you can click this center alignment button. And now the image is centered. Moving down the list, we have uh, insert an audio file. Uh, if you have any just I or audio files in, within your website files, then you'd be able to find it in here. In this case, we don't. Um, it's not a really common thing to have, but once you add one, then it's basically just going to give the user a play button. They click play, and then they can hear the audio that's set to sit here. Here, uh, this is using our one of our modules that generates charts based on data that you input. It's not used by a lot of our clients, so I won't get too in depth with it, but um, you can select which type of chart that you wanna do. Um, you select your chart. If you have the module, then all of your charts would show up here. You can do a table as well. In this situation, I'll do pi, click OK, and then here's the pie chart. Jack, um, we had a question in the comments section. Oh, sorry about that. Yep, OK. So the question was, I was once told not to adjust the size here. And I'm assuming that the size was referring to here. Now, it's OK if your if your image is, let's say, 224 by 224, just like this one. If you want to adjust it based on this to 200, then that's completely fine. Where you want to use the photo editor is, let's say, if you have an image that's 2000 by 1500, then you would want to use the photo editor, resize it to be something manageable. I usually put them to around 500 pixels. Uh, that keeps it small enough so it's not using your database space in a, in a wasteful way. Um, but if you're just making small adjustments to your sizing, then it's definitely okay to do it in here. Good question. Okay. So here we have embed a file. So I did an example of one right here. So basically what this does, I will just say test file embed, highlight that, and then I'll select our button. This button might not appear on some of your content editors. It depends on if you have the files module if you do have the files module and you don't see this button, that just means it needs to be enabled. Uh, you can contact, contact your project manager and we can get this set up for you. But if you do have it and you want to set up a file embed, you would just highlight your text. So like this. And then you select your category that you want to go into and then your files within this category open a new window, same window, 
This is uh, kind of what I touched on earlier with your linking. Uh, new window, you're probably going to want this to be a new window because if you're just opening up a document, then you want them to be able to get back to your site easily. So I'll go new window for this one and click OK. And then if we go down and we preview, then we can see our preview here. In my test one, within their file, they added a description to that file. This file does not have a description. So that's why there's no description under it, but that's why there's a description there. When users click on it, it'll open this up and then whatever is uh, added into that file will show up there. Same thing here. Okay, so that is embedding a file. Now you can also embed YouTube videos. So I did a test one here, but I'll, I'll do it again just to show. All you do is you would just take a YouTube URL and then you paste the URL into here. You select your size and then you can choose a title. Title helps with the accessibility so a screen reader can tell what the video is about. We'll do test title. And then you can preview your settings. Oh, let's find a YouTube video. We can use, uh, we'll go back and copy this link and we'll just do it again. Paste the link, choose your size press title, and then you click preview settings every time you make a change. So if I want to change the size, preview settings, here you go. Preview settings, get smaller. So if I click OK, then your embed your embedded video will show up here. Um, when you choose a size like this, this is going to be a static size. So no matter what, uh, no matter how the user is viewing this page, the video is always going to be this size. So that means it's not always going to be responsive. If I want this to be responsive, then this is a little bit of an advanced tip, but you would go into your source code. You'd scroll down and then you find your video. So you see YouTube here. This must be my video. This is the test one that I made earlier. So I changed width equals 75%. Down here on the new one I just made, I chose just a static size. So I see that it says width equals 640. If I wanted to make this video take up 50% of whatever page is being looked at, and you get out of source. And now we see that this video is only taking up 50% of the page. We can preview it and show. Scroll down. We see this video is at 50%. So it's at 50% of the page. Or up here, I have it set to 75%. So it's at 75% of the page. Okay, moving on. Now we have, if you have the photo albums module, there's we have a button here to insert a slideshow. When you insert a slideshow, you would just select here and then any slideshow or any photo album that you have set up will uh, show up here. In this case, on this uh, test demo site, uh, we just have this one here. So it's as simple as clicking this, select your alignment left or right. If you don't select anything, then it'll automatically center. It'll give you a preview of what you have. You can click through all of your images click OK, and then it'll show up. So if we go back and we preview, then we see that it is now appearing. OK, now moving on, we have this uh, tool right here, which checks your accessibility for uh, this page. So what this is going to do is it's going to just scrape everything that you have on this page. And if there's any accessibility issues, then uh, it will give you a little pop-up 
In this case, it does not. So we're all okay. We're all, all good. Okay. And then I'll make an example of something that would trigger an error. If this image didn't have any alt text on it, and I click this button again, then it'll give me a notice. It'll it'll explain what the issue is, and then explain why the issue is happening and how to solve it. So in this case, I would just say global reach logo, select quick fix, and then it'll give me a notification that everything's good now. Here is your links. If I wanted to add a link, then I can either start by just clicking the link, typing in the display text, and then adding a URL to it. Click OK. Jack, we have another question in the comments section. I am not seeing the question. Could, do you mind reading that out for me, Eleni? Actually, oh, it's um, in addition, looks like it's part of Lisa C's last question. Um, I've been linking to a document under the website files. Looks like it may be better to embed the file. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we can just get into that here. So test file. Um, so you can either use that embed tool or you can use this. Oh, and you'll need to reshare your screen. Uh, oh, sorry about that. Okay. So you can either embed the file uh, here by just using that as we did earlier, and then it'll show up like this. Or you can just select a uh, link to the file. So we have the text typed out here, test file. We'll link it. We see it grab that text for the display text, and then we can do globalreach.com. Uh, if you want to link to something internally, just like Matt asked in the question, then you can browse server like we did for the images to select the image, go into your website files, and then we can link to this image. Now, this won't cause the image to show up. We would use the image tool for that. But once users click on this link, then it will show the image in here. So, um, that was just a preview, so it's not going to find it. Um, if I wanted to make that open up in a new window, since it's opening up an attachment, you're probably going to want it in a new window, so then users can get back to your site easily. Click New Window. And then here, I do or we do use this advanced tab, unlike the image, uh, style sheet classes. For these, we have primary, secondary, and tertiary. These will add button styles uh, to your link if you don't want it to just show up like it did with just the typical text and then the line under it. So if I type in primary here and click OK, we go to preview. Now we see that it shows up as a button. Secondary and tertiary will just change. Uh, it depends on the styling that was set when your website was developed. But uh, let's say secondary would make the button red. And then let's say tertiary was just a, a thin border around a test file in all caps. Uh, so those, those, three, those three commands are how you're going to get your buttons for your links. Select OK. And then the button right next to it, if you have a link and you don't want it linked anymore, you can just select this unlink button and now it's not linked anymore. Now it'll just be normal text on your site. Now we have your anchors. So I set up. Okay. 
Um, is it better to do one or one or the other link versus embed? Looks like more options when linking buttons, etc. Yep. So uh, basically, the difference is how they just display like this. Uh, this will give the size of the file. If you have a description that goes along with the file, then it'll sh uh, show up down here. Or if you just link it, it's just going to look like a button. So it's uh, pretty much personal preference, whichever you'd like to do. Um, but there are two separate options that you can go with there. Another good question. So if we're looking at our anchors, anchors are basically um, people use them as table of contents. If you have a really, really long page with a bunch of information on it and a ton of different headers, then you can add a little table of contents using anchors. So here I set up a little table of contents here and I scroll down. I can find these two anchor destinations that I set up. So if I want to do that, I would highlight this, and this will be my anchor now. I'd select this little flag, and then you name the anchor, whatever you'd like. I'll just name it one. And then we'll name this one two. Click OK. Now we have our anchors set. So if you go back up to your table of contents here, I'll highlight this. And then we'll use our link button. Now we'll go into our link type. And instead of URL, we're going to click link to anchor in the text by anchor name. And then both of your or all of your anchors will show up here. You just select your anchor name, click OK. And then now that will be a link. I'll do that for the second one as well. Whoops. Want to go into the link, change the link type link to anchor in text, find the anchor I want to link to, click OK. And then let's save and publish and take a look. So if I click anchor one, then I'm brought down to anchor destination one. If I click anchor two, then I'm brought down to two. Let's say that I want to link to another page, an anchor that lives on another page. So if I wanted to do that, I would change this link type back to URL. And I will just grab a random page that we have as an example. And then I'll set up a new anchor on here. Let's anchor a new page. I will make this and call it free. And I will save and publish that. So you have your anchor set up on your new page, and uh, you want to link to that anchor on that page. Now, th this page doesn't have any, uh, any other content, so it's just going to bring us to the top of the page as, in, or as any other link would. Um, but if this anchor were in the middle of a bunch of content on this page, then what we would do is we'd go to that page and then we find, we grab this link up here. We'll copy that. And then now we're back to our anchor and we want to link to uh, the anchor on the other page. We'll just paste that URL in there. We'll leave everything as is. We'll do the pound sign and then the anchor. So in this case, it is your link, pound sign three. Okay. Now we'll go to save and publish. Then we'll look at the page, pull that up again. And then now it takes us to the anchor. Um, if we didn't have that pound sign and the anchor name, then when the page loaded, it would look like this. But in this case, it looked like this since it was taking us to the anchor. OK, now we have tables. Adding tables should only be used when you have tabular data. Um, if you're just using tables to uh, organize your images or display images in a certain uh, grid pattern, then that can sometimes uh, 
have accessibility issues, there are ways around that. Uh, just contact your con or your project manager if you're wanting to arrange your photos in a different way or a way that you feel you're not able to. But if you wanted to start up a new table, then you can uh, decide your amount of rows, your amount of columns, headers, uh, first row, first column, or both. In order for your table to be compliant, you have to have one of these chosen. Otherwise, the screen reader will just start reading everything in the table and it, none of it will make sense to the user. Uh, border size, same thing with image. It'll just add a little border. If you don't want a border, you can just leave it blank. Alignment, left, right, or center. Caption and summary. Though these both also help with compliance, so the screen reader knows what the table is talking about. Width here, um, you can reach out to your project manager about uh, getting this menu updated on your admin. We did recently just make uh, make an update. If you don't already have it, then uh, you can contact us, and then this will automatically give you a percentage. Uh, similar to the YouTube embeds, uh, this will just give you a width of 500 pixels and it won't be responsive. But if you want the table to be 100% width on that page, you just type in 100% and then you click OK. And then now it's sort of hard to see. I'll add a border so you can see it a little bit better. Now we have our table here. We decided that... Um, we add three columns or three rows, three columns, and our headers are in the first column, meaning that header one is going to be bold. We'll just copy that over and over. And then all the data over here will just go directly east and west. So that's how the screen reader will read it since it's first column. If it was first row, then the screen reader would go down. And then if it was both, then the screen reader would reference both the first column and the first uh, the first row to decide what the data in between those two mean. Within your table properties, in the advanced tab, we have three classes that we use. I typically use all of them because it just loads up the styling and it makes it look good. It makes it uh, responsive. So if you have a bunch of data that may be confusing to a screen reader when it's trying to make it smaller on a phone, it'll break it up so it all makes sense. Uh, what you should type in here is styled, striped, should spell styled right, and table saw. Then once you have that, you click OK. Nothing will change here, but, oops. On the front end, we will see what that looks like. We go and preview this page. And go down. We see that our headers are in the first column. So that's why these are like this. Um, if you did first row, then the first row would be this, this color. Uh, it's sort of hard to see with the styling for this website but it is uh, they are two different colors uh, it'll look different on yours based on uh, what what you have set up for yours um, but that's how you style your tables and then to continue down this line we have the undo button if you do something that you didn't mean to you click undo and then if you undo something then this button won't be doled out anymore and you can redo it uh, here is how to view your source. Um, if you're uh, good at HTML and editing from this type of view, then you can do everything that I've been doing from this source code. Uh, you would just need to select source and then get into it this way. And then the final, I guess, functionality that we have in our toolbar is to add a line. So this is just if you want to uh, close off a section if I wanted a line to finish off my table of contents right here, I would just click to the end of whatever text or content that I have on this line, click the line, and then now we have a line. Um, to get rid of it, you would just select backspace, and then now it's gone. And then our last one here is 
they maximize. This just makes it a lot bigger, so you're not just working with the little section of your screen that we were doing before. So that went a little bit longer than uh, our tip or our meetings typically go. I wanted to touch on all of these. I know that it's a pretty popular topic. So now I will open it up to any questions that anybody might have. Okay. All right. First question, uh, Dustin would like for us to go through what we do in the YouTube embeds to change the size again. So if you have your embedded YouTube video here, you would, uh, or you find your YouTube video. So you'd have to do that within the source code. You scroll down. If, uh, if you want to find a quick way to get to your YouTube video, you can click within this source code editor, select control F and then the search bar will come up. You can just start typing YouTube and then you find it. Um, when you just add the YouTube link, then it will be something like width equals 650. You can just remove that. Make sure to keep the two quotation marks. And then if I wanted to take up 60% of the page, just type in 60%. And then it will be adjusted to take up 60% instead of the 75% that we had. Uh, the second part of the question, uh, the description in the email invite mentioned utilizing test pages. So this is kind of what I'm doing here. Um, I just created a test page on my website. When you set up your test page, it's important to um, keep it hidden from the front end of your site. Since you want to see what it will look like on the front end, you can keep it enabled, but you would say no to show and navigation, no to sitemap, no to so show and search. This field only really applies when you have a search bar at the top of your website. If you don't have that, then you don't have to worry about this. Default page, we're gonna leave that as no. And then if we scroll down here, we see in the content optimization, visible to search engines, we'll do no, since we don't want somebody to accidentally stumble upon this page with a random Google search. So once you make all these settings and it'll be completely hidden, the only way that somebody would be able to access this page is if they have the exact URL that this page is, um, which the odds of that are pretty slim, but technically there could be a slight chance of somebody running across it but um, i've never run into that before just selecting no for all of these and no down here seems to uh, do the trick sitemap icons um so sitemap icons i'm assuming what that is is Okay. Yep. All right. So what those are is uh, we have the icons right here. Basically, a, a quick overview of what these are is this is going to view this page. So whatever you have on this page, you click on it, and then it'll pull up the page. Uh, this is the page on the live site. It's not really a preview. Um, it's just going to pull up the page right away so you don't have to dig through everything. This icon right here is to add a new child page. Uh, so with this child page, it's the same thing as adding a new page. If I added a new page, then the new page would show up just on the bottom of the list here. If I wanted to make a, a new child page under Austin test content, then I would select this add a new child page. I'd go through the settings to create my page, and then the page would show up under this testimonials right here. And this link button, if... Uh, let's say on this page, test one, if I had an image on this page, uh, an image that was uh, embedded in or uh, just linked to this page, then it would tell me here. Um, if there's something linking to this page, then it won't let you disable or delete it because, um, or it, it won't let you, uh, if there's another page that leads to this page, then it won't let you disable or delete it in order to prevent broken links. 
um, in this editing section here. That's just what we've been doing. Uh, that's what the yellow pencil does. And then removing the or deleting the page would be right here. Once you delete a page, I won't actually delete it. But if I do click delete and it says, are you sure? Click OK. The page will stay here. And then there's this little uh, blue arrow that's over the trash can. And then that's restore. This is just a safeguard in case you accidentally cancel some, or remove something. If I scroll up and I see this publish button is up here, this means that there's a change that's not yet published. So this would be an example of a change that's not published since there's this orange, uh, orange X right here. So if I go into publish, then I will see the page that I modified. And the reason was because I deleted it. So if I wanted to delete it, then I would select this publish button, but I don't want to delete it. So I'm not going to do that. I'll go back down to the bottom. I'll restore it. And then once you restore it, one more safeguard, just to make sure that you are ready to bring it back onto your site is you have to go back in and edit it. And then we see we can either publish here or save and publish. These both do the same thing. So I'll just save and publish, and now we have our page back. Okay, moving on. Changing the styles on headers. Uh, if so, does it change them going forward, or will it change throughout the website? Um, you can't. The headers that you see uh, within here, these are not editable. Um, these are just what comes out of the box with our platform. And then that's why we give you that separate uh, website styles where you can just make your own and uh, customize them however you like. Um, if you were, if you had, uh, let's say this, this test styling in multiple places on your site, if you want and you updated your website style, this style right here, then once you make that change, it would change everywhere that it does exist on your site. What are the different table types? Um, the different table types are, we'll do another table here. Okay. Then we'll go into our table properties. Um, The different table types are just styled, striped, and table saw. You are able to just uh, use one of them. You can use two of them, but I recommend using all three of them. Uh, that, that'll just make it styled so it uh, looks uniform with the styling on your website, and it'll also uh, make it responsive to, um, to screen readers when you have information that might not be as simple as uh, headers in the row and just going down. So it'll it'll help break it up and make it readable on any device. And then just, just for review, so we can do it again, it's styled, striped, and table saw. These can all be interchanged in any order. It is important that they're all lowercase though. If you do an uppercase, then it will not trigger in the system and it won't know what you're saying. So make sure it's all in lowercase and uh, you can arrange them however you'd like. Anything else? Sure. Uh, so Sarah just recommended to me that we can go over using the photo editor since that was brought up earlier. So in your photo editor, you'll it'll be within one of these uh, sections on the left side of your uh, 
admin. You go down and you'll find photo editor. Within your photo editor, you can choose a file that you want to edit. And this is basically a mini Photoshop, I guess. So if I want to, um, finding a picture, then we'll do this. We'll hit submit. Now we see the image that we just uploaded. On the right hand side, we have all of our tools. You can resize it. It will adjust to be proportionate. If you make an image bigger, it's often going to make it a little bit more blurry. Um, that's just how images work and their sizing. Um, if you change the size and you want it to go back, this is a little history here. You can just click this and then it'll bring it back. If I wanted to crop it, then it gives you a little editor where you can just do it with your mouse or you can type in specific dimensions if you need an image to be an exact size then you can do that like this click apply and then it'll crop it for you if you don't like that go back you can do that through your history you can route it rotate it clockwise and then something that we recommend doing um is reducing file size. This will just save your web space. Uh, you're allocated a certain amount. So the smaller, uh, the smaller space that all of your images take up, the more space you'll have to add more files. Then you can save it either to your computer or to your website files. If you just click save, then it would go in your download section in your file explorer on your computer. If you click website files, it'll have you uh, select a folder here. So in this case, I can just add it to this test folder, click select, name it, save it, and then it'll go into my website files. Now, going back to the question earlier that said to not adjust the image sizes um, within your content editor, but to do it in your photo editor, that is correct. If my, if my image was 5,000 by 4,000, then I would make it 500 by 400 in uh, this section right here. So then it's it's going to be that smaller size. It's not going to show up any bigger or smaller. Um, it's just better to have it like that when it's saved within your website files. And it'll also speed up your website when it's on the front end. And it's actually a smaller size than that original uh, large one. So can you talk more about reduce file size? Should you do that on all images? I would recommend doing it on all images. All it's going to do is shrink the size of the file that you have. Um, it's just going to make it smaller so it takes up less space in your database. Um, there are times like this one where this image is so small, it's 10.57 kilobytes. Uh, sometimes reduce file size since it has so many history or so much history of you adjusting the file, it'll actually go up. But this is such a small number, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's more important on larger images or uh, files that are just larger in general. Uh, there are also free tools online. If you have, let's say, a PDF within your photo editor, you can't, uh, you can't upload a PDF to it. But there are free online tools that if you have a PDF with uh, 15 large, nice, crisp images on it, those can sometimes get really big. So you can just go online, find, I know Adobe has a good one that's free. Uh, I think you have to make a free account for it, but um, you just upload your PDF. It'll compress the size. And then if it's added onto your website and your website files, it'll take up a lot less room. what is a good file size max um so most websites it, it depends on how your website is laid out i'd say on most websites the maximum size you're going to get is or on your inside pages at least are going to be around 700 pixels i try to shoot for anything below 700 if the image is above 700 then i would bring it down to at least 700 uh, I'll typically do 500 unless you really want to keep or cover the entire page with that image. But 
I wouldn't go much higher than 700, but you can do testing on your own to see which uh, which size helps you what or uh, your website based on how it was developed. Anything else? We we have gone over, and I want to respect everybody's time. Um, I don't have anything coming up, so if anybody has uh, any quick questions that I can get covered uh, right now, then feel free to send them over. Otherwise, um, thank you all for joining. <laughs>